Well, in the early 60s, uh, when I started down there, uh, nobody knew how to spell environment, let alone do anything about it. This is where they lived, and so they're, they're very tied to it, both spiritually and historically. Their ancestors are buried near it. Um, it is the center of their world. It's, it, it's been referred to off and on as the most polluted lake in the United States. This is the story of two lakes. One high in the hills formed by glaciers, narrow, deep and pure. The other lake was wider and shallower, but it was a jewel and it was a holy lake to the Iroquois Indians. One of the lakes is still as pure as the day it was created. The other lake is now one of the most polluted in the world. The lakes are connected in ways most of us wouldn't understand. This is a tale of those two lakes, Scaniatlas and Onondaga, the beauty and the beast, and how they became like that. The beast in our story is called Onondaga Lake. Onondaga Lake was central to the Six Nations of the Iroquois, the Native Americans who populated upstate New York. Well, the lake is sacred to the Onondagas and the other nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy because centuries ago, it was on the shores of the lake that their peacemaker formed their confederacy. Along the shores of the lake were pools of brine that were a source of necessary salt. The lake itself teemed with fish, the shores were full of wildlife, Reeds grew in the surrounding swamps with which they were able to make all kinds of containers and other vessels. Onondaga Lake was the first site of white European settlement in central New York when the French explorers came in the 1600s. But the French settlement didn't last and the lake continued unspoiled. After the Revolutionary War, the next wave of European settlement came to Onondaga Lake. Initially, few people settled around the lake because it was surrounded by a swamp which was infested with mosquitoes and black flies. But when the Erie Canal came to upstate New York in the early 1800s, the lake quickly became a focal point of settlement and industry. The swamps were drained and a salt industry grew up around the lake, taking advantage of the brine pools. There were then so many fish in the lake that it supported a vibrant fishing industry. By 1880, the lake was ringed with amusement parks, hotels, resorts, and bathing beaches. And it was until the 1880s that Onondaga Lake had resort hotels around the same side of the lake that the, we now have an industrial wasteland. The whitefish from Onondaga Lake were a delicacy in New York City restaurants before Salve Process and the other industrial a uh, mess uh, moved in there. But later in the 1880s, two things happened which would change the lake forever. In 1884, the Solvay Process Company, later to become Allied Signal Corporation, began industrial production of soda ash along the shores of the lake. In 1888, an event known as the Great Water Steal occurred and a decision was made to stop drawing fresh water from Onondaga Lake and get it from another source. That source was Skinny Atlas Lake. William Henry Seward, President Lincoln's Secretary of State, one of the well-traveled Americans of the mid-19th century, called Skinny Atlas Lake the most beautiful body of water in the world. It's a narrow, long and deep glacial lake, one of New York's famous finger lakes. The Iroquois named it Skinny Atlas, which means long lake. Sitting 867 feet above sea level, Skinny Atlas Lake is the highest of the finger lakes and is called the roof garden of the finger lakes. It's almost 14 miles long, 
with gorge-like sides that drop off quickly. Its width ranges from one mile to a quarter mile wide with a maximum depth of 300 feet. Due to its remote location and relative inaccessibility, Skinny Atlas Lake never saw the kind of early settlement that Syracuse did after the building of the Erie Canal. In the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed, we have a, a, a shape created by the glaciers, as was the case in all the Finger Lakes, that caused development patterns along with its location that didn't stress it. And so we got, a, we got lucky in that sense that uh, the major cities d didn't get constructed in the watershed. Because of the stunning natural beauty of the lake, it became a popular resort area and many wealthy people were attracted to the physical beauty of the lake and its surroundings. By 1880, the growing industrial city of Syracuse was in desperate need of a reliable and cheap source of water. Onondaga Lake couldn't work because it was lower in elevation than the city and the city government couldn't afford to pump Onondaga Lake water into their system. Skinny Atlas Lake, which was 460 feet above the level of the Erie Canal in Syracuse, would ensure adequate gravity flow along the nearly 20 miles length of required conduit. This eliminated the need for costly mechanical pumping. In what became known as the Great Water Steel, the city of Syracuse convinced the New York State Legislature to give Syracuse the rights to the water of Skinny Atlas Lake. By 1894, a 30 inch cast iron conduit that stretched 19 miles from Skinny Atlas to Syracuse was completed, and the city of Syracuse started drawing all of its water from Skinny Atlas Lake. Once Onondaga Lake was no longer needed for drinking water, a profound psychological shift began in the public perception of what Onondaga Lake could be used for. In 1884, the Solvay Process Company begins soda ash production along the shores of Onondaga Lake. Eventually, they will dump up to six million pounds per day of salty waste into the lake. And this continues until the company closes in 1986 as Allied Chemical, later to become the Honeywell Corporation. In 1901, as a condition of the lake deteriorates, ice harvesting is prohibited. The amusement parks and resorts around the lake begin to close permanently. Lakeshore homes are abandoned. In 1918, the Solvay Process Company begins production of organic chemicals. The waste from that production is dumped into the lake. In 1940, swimming is banned and the last public beach is closed because of sewage contamination. Raw sewage from Syracuse's sanitary sewage system is discharged into the lake during periods of heavy rain, a practice that continues to this day. In 1946, Solvay Process, now Allied Chemical, begins chlorine production on the shores of Onondaga Lake. Mercury wastes from the process are discharged directly into the lake. In 1970, all fishing is banned. It is discovered the fish are heavily contaminated with mercury. It is calculated that 22 pounds per day of mercury have been discharged into the lake. The United States Attorney General finally sues Allied Chemical to stop the mercury dumping. The Attorney General's office estimates that from 1946 to 1970, Allied has dumped almost 165,000 pounds of mercury into Onondaga Lake, contaminating 7 million cubic yards of sediment on the lake bottom. 76 years after the decision is made to stop drawing drinking water from Onondaga Lake, Onondaga Lake is recognized as one of the most polluted bodies of water in the world. It is one of only three lakes on the Environmental Protection Agency's Federal Superfund list of toxic waste sites. It had literally become a massive toilet bowl for the city of Syracuse.
19 miles away, still connected by the same 30-inch pipe, Skinny Atlas Lake is recognized as one of the cleanest lakes in the world. Today, the city of Syracuse draws 42 million gallons of Skinny Atlas Lake water per day. So pure is its water, it is one of the very few water sources in the United States that does not require filtration. In a nationwide taste test, Skinny Atlas Lake Water was ranked second, coming in behind only the pure glacial waters of Anchorage, Alaska. Since 1894, the city of Syracuse has enforced around Skinny Atlas Lake some of the most dramatic and drastic environmental regulations ever developed in the United States. No sewage may be discharged into the lake, treated or untreated, without severe penalty. Because there is no sewage system around most of the lake, the city water department developed a variety of methods for dealing with the waste products of the residents. For many years, the city water department's honey wagon was a familiar sight to the summer residents of the lake. The water department's outhouses were placed behind summer homes around the lake, and city workers spent their days emptying their outhouse buckets by hand. The city also supported the development of sewage treatment facilities in the village of Skinny Atlas and regularly patrolled homes and farms around the lake to ensure the water's purity. Skinny Atlas Lake has been immune from the development pressure other lakes have seen in recent years because of those strict rules. As a result, Skinny Atlas is almost locked in time. It remains the same jewel in 2004 that it was in 1884 when the city of Syracuse first looked upon it as a source of water. A visit to Skinny Atlas today reveals a quaint village that is a major upstate New York tourist destination. The village sits on the lake on its northern end. It has quaint shops and expensive restaurants. The village sees visitors from around the world and has been the summer home of the rich and famous including President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Senator Robert Kennedy and Bill and Hillary Clinton. Visitors to the village can swim on a village beach or enjoy a stroll along the village pier which extends hundreds of feet into the lake. A drive around the lake reveals multi-million dollar lakefront homes interspersed with farms. The views from the hills surrounding the lake reveal some of the most beautiful scenery in the eastern United States. The lake is noted for its fishery, which includes rainbow trout and landlocked salmon. Village homes are the most expensive in central New York. By contrast, Onondaga Lake has no lakefront homes. Though a county park extends along much of the eastern shore of the lake, access to most of the lakefront is severely restricted because of the highways and industries that ring the lake. A drive around Onondaga Lake reveals heavy industry, a major shopping mall, and areas of restricted access. One might even say that most of the area around Onondaga Lake could be called an industrial wasteland. Old waste beds containing the waste products of soda ash manufacturing tower hundreds of feet above the lake shore. Other areas of industrial waste continue to leak pollutants into the lake. Well, we made, uh, we made chlorine gas, um, caustic, caustic soda, uh, hydrochloric acid, uh, all good stuff, you know, very potent. The vast sewage treatment plant of the city of Syracuse sits on the southern end of the lake. Though forced by lawsuits to improve the processing of Syracuse's sewage and stop dumping raw sewage into the lake, it too continues as a source of lake pollution. There's a cement and case sewer line. It's an overflow line out of the village water pool. It runs right out in the middle of the lake. Anybody know that? I know it because I hit it with my boat. <laughs> it cost me a fortune to get my boat fixed. And that's probably the only reason why I know it. 
The disagreeable odors emitted by the plant keep people away from usable areas of the lake. Those who do use the lake can fish from the shore or from boats, but are banned from eating the fish. Swimming in Onondaga Lake is still prohibited some 65 years after the first swimming ban went into effect. Today, as Skinny Atlas Lake continues to sit pristinely 20 miles and a world away, massive cleanup plans are being proposed for Onondaga Lake. Spurred on by private lawsuits in the 1970s, New York State successfully sued the lake's major polluter in 1989, the Honeywell Corporation, successor to the original Solvay Process Company, and it's now required to clean up the mercury and other pollutants it dumped into the lake for almost a hundred years. There are more than 82 tons of mercury on the lake bottom the costs may be enormous. Both the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, and Honeywell have offered several competing plans. i got to tell you, that's the problem, is that they don't have the understanding of the site and the behavior of, of these industrial contaminants. If they had the right scientific understanding and related mathematical models, they would actually be able to tell us what you get for each plan so that you could evaluate whether or not it's worth or necessary to go from the cheaper plan to the more expensive plan. Honeywell would dredge and then cap the bottom of the lake to try keeping the mercury and other pollutants from continuing to enter the water. Um, that plan is not adequate. It is not acceptable to the nation because it allows Honeywell to only clean up 20% of the mercury in the bottom of the lake. People should understand that the mercury is as deep as 60 feet deep into the lake, that it's still leaching in from the Salve shoreline fa five times faster than it's leaving. Honeywell's proposals range in costs from $200 million to $1.2 billion and would dredge up to 11 million cubic yards of lake bottom. The DEC's proposal would cost up to $2.3 billion, dredge 21 million cubic yards, and take 17 years to complete. Neither organization's proposals would completely clean up the lake. Both represent the largest public works projects ever undertaken in upstate New York. The various proposals are collected in a three-volume report that is as thick as five large telephone books. There are no real goals and objectives, so it's hard to, to even evaluate any particular plan in relation to, to a non-existent goal. Let's just assume it's the $250-odd million dollar DEC plan. That will take at least three years just to do the conceptual uh, and detailed engineering that will enable you to do the work. Uh, then it will take probably five years to do the construction, but then you'll have to monitor uh, and see if that's successful for at least 30 years, if not indefinitely. And at any point, if it's not working, if there's a, a problem in the cap, if somebody, you know, drives a a boat anchor across and rips up the cap, they have to come and fix it. So the potential, you know, just, just that rather simple part of, of things is going to take, you know, upwards of a decade and probably will have to be two or three decades of watching to see whether we've made progress. At the end of 2004, a new player entered the game. Their mandate, it's, as traditional native leaders, they're, they're obligated to try to preserve things for the seventh generation into the future. And part of that now is to try to force Honeywell and other responsible parties to clean up that lake and all of the sources of pollution that go into it. The Onondaga Nation finally filed its long-awaited land claim suit. The Onondagas, like other Native American nations in upstate New York, 
claim that their tribal lands were illegally taken away in the 18th and 19th centuries. Unlike other nations, however, the Onondagas are not seeking to have their lands returned. They are instead asking that Onondaga Lake, an important part of their cultural heritage, be completely restored. In their view, neither the Honeywell nor the DEC plans go far enough to clean up the lake. The Superfund Act mandates that an Indian nation should be consulted throughout the process. They would like to see it restored to where it, the water is drinkable, the fish are edible, and it becomes a recreational and uh, spiritual center that it was before. So, what are we to make of this tale of two lakes, the beauty and the beast? As Skinny Atlas Lake sits serenely far away and high above Onondaga Lake, it too is not immune from the pressures of development. In 1996, the uh, town adopted a comprehensive plan that uh, acknowledged that there was a problem with water degradation here in the lake, particularly from agricultural uses and residential development. The farms around it are disappearing as there is pressure to develop more of the shoreline because of the high value that is placed on lakefront property. Farmland that had been in farming for generations is now slowly being turned over into residential housing. When the houses are being built, land is, is, uh, is opened up and, and, and runoff occurs from, from that that uh, impacts the lake. The use of pesticides and herbicides and things of that sort on lawns, uh, septic systems that fail, all those things are potential problems in the future. Its own beauty and desirability may yet be the source of a future downfall. By hundreds of people uh, focused on the maintaining the quality of Skinny Atlas Lake. And here's a village at the north end of that lake with some of the highest real estate values in this area. So the economics are obvious and the, and the lessons are pretty clear. By allowing even a small amount of development in the wrong place in the watershed could do a tremendous amount of damage. But Skinny Atlas does have its protectors and they are wealthy and powerful and as history has shown, they will go to extremes to protect it. It's the literal proof that, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is, is worth a, a pound of cure. Uh, it's just so much less expensive to prevent that from occurring than it is to try and resolve or restore a, a, a body of water of that size after the, the kind of uh, damage that, that's been done. Uh, that's a lesson that's hard not to learn from, uh, from the Onondaga Lake experience. Unless we get some sort of an organized plan and we get better zoning controls and planning uh, throughout the entire watershed, we're going to get greater development and more runoff into the water. There's, there's a need for vision in this and there's a need for commitment to do some things that are probably politically unpopular to do. It is Onondaga Lake that is our tragically lost resource. Clean is, clean is to me, when, when somebody was come to me and say, the lake is done, it's clean, means you can walk in there barefoot and not expect to come out and glow. The story of the benign and active neglect that killed Onondaga Lake is like a warning beacon reminding us all of the monumental struggles we will face to reclaim the environment that was so willingly given away.